Japanese philosopher Masanobu Fukuoka once said the ultimate goal of farming is not growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. As a farmer himself, Fukuoka understood that the quality of work was important because it would go on to fuel and sustain his community. There is also a warm admiration of the farmer and the character that sows the land. But I'm willing to bet my ass that Fukuoka never traveled to the Picton Pig Farm in Port Coquitlam, Vancouver, the home and killing grounds of Willie Picton. Pig Farm, where police had found the remains of some of Vancouver's missing women, aka Pork Chop Rob. Other gruesome details revealed DNA of the murdered women found in processed meat on his farm, aka Pig Farmer Killer. Police and the Crown were negligent in pursuing Picton. Whatever you call him, don't call him Lake to Slaughter because this pig man is the most prolific Canadian serial killer of all time. It was there in Port Coquitlam in October of 1949 that a strange boy destined for infamy was born. Robert William Picton, or Willie, was the middle child of three, and the Pictons were a working class pig farming family. Leonard Picton, the father, was tough on his kids, but it was Louise, the family's bearded matriarch that ran the family farm. It's not out of the ordinary for a farming family's children to be an important part of their workforce, but the Pictons drove their kids especially hard. As soon as they were walking and talking, Willie, his older sister Linda, and his little brother Dave were responsible for the dirty work on the farm. Even during the school year, they were trekking through mud and pig shit to feed the pigs twice a day before and after school. The Pictons were a shamelessly dirty family. Their home was always covered in mud and they didn't even own a shower. They would wear the same set of clothes every day. If that weren't bad enough, Willie had a strong adversity to water and bathing in general. He would go months before being forced by a less filthy member of his family to clean himself. Port Coquitlam was originally a farming community, evident by the sprawling herds of livestock and the crop-covered land. But in 1913, Riverview Mental Hospital was opened on the large hill overlooking the city's farmlands. Port Coquitlam's demographics began to change as the community absorbed hundreds of healthcare professionals. By the time Willie was going to school, about half of his classmates were from upper-class families. But even the kids from the farming families thought he smelled like shit. Combine that with Willie's high-pitched, squeaky voice and you got yourself a bully me bundle. And bully him they did. Throughout his early school years, Willie was harassed by his peers. But he always had Dave, his socially capable, less smelly younger brother, to keep him out of trouble. And this is something we will see again and again throughout their lives. It was also when Willie started going to school that it became clear he was a few fries short of a happy meal and he was placed in special ed. But Willie wasn't completely incompetent. At the young age of 12, he went down to the livestock auction and he bought himself a calf with money that he'd saved up. You see, friends were tough to come by for Willie, so he poured his attention and his affection into that cow, spending time with it and making sure it was always well fed. But one day he came home from school and she wasn't in the pasture. When he asked his father where she might be, he told his young boy to go check the barn. And I think it was the moment when 12-year-old Willie rounded the barn door and saw his pet butchered and hanging on a hook that he lost or maybe gave up on the ability to love. In the late 50s, the Pictons had to sell the farm. The Canadian government didn't care that the farm was bought in 1905 by William Picton and passed down through three generation of Picton pig farmers because they had a highway to build. Willie was 14 years old when the Pictons moved to 40 acres of swampland, ironically near a highway, and they arrived one Picton short. Older sister Linda was done with the pig life and she moved to Vancouver. This new land was peppered with quicksand and the back was a useless stretch of lagoon, but the Pictons dug in and worked harder than ever. 
By the time Willie and Dave were in high school, they were working 700 pigs. They even used their lunch hour from school to squeeze in a quick third feeding. Unashamed when they returned in the same pig shit covered clothes they wore daily, even now more covered in pig shit. They couldn't help it. White trash work ethic ran in the Picton's blood. Luis opened up another cash stream when she purchased a handful of commercial freezers at auction and put them on the family farm. The name of the operation was BNC Frozen Foods, but it was known locally simply as the Meat Locker. Townies could purchase large quantities of meat and store it there, picking up what they needed at their convenience. As the Picton's cash flow continued to increase, it seemed to have an inverse effect on their standard of living. Their home barely had any furniture at all, and the only thing in the living room was a mattress stained black from mud. With the meat business taking off, Willie dropped out of school at 15 after an argument with the principal, opting instead to get an apprenticeship under a butcher that the family worked with. Although Willie never impressed anybody with his book learning, he was a sight to behold with a set of knives. He picked up the trade like it was in him all along, and just like that, the dullest boy in town quickly became known as the best with a sharp blade. Things were finally looking up for Willie. He had a job, he wasn't being picked on, and he was gaining a semblance of respect among his peers. But trouble followed the Pictons. In October of 1967, Willie's 16-year-old younger brother, David, took the farm truck out to practice driving. It's unclear exactly how it happened, but somehow Dave struck a 14-year-old boy who was walking home. When Dave saw how serious it was, he panicked and he raced home. Where most parents would probably call an ambulance for the injured child, Louis Picton instructed Dave to hose the truck off and run it to the local mechanic to get the dent banged out. Meanwhile, Luis took it upon herself to drive to the scene of the accident. When she got there, the boy was still clinging to life, and he probably would have made it if he was given medical attention. But instead, Luis rolled the mangled boy face down into a puddle, leaving him there to drown. The mechanic that worked on the truck thought it was odd that the Pictons had a dent removed. The farm truck was covered in dents. So when he saw the news of the dead boy on TV the next day, he called the RCMP. The death was ruled a drowning, and David got off light, receiving probation and a suspended license. Louise Picton, having kept a role a secret from anybody not named Picton, did not face any consequences at all. All the while, Willie was watching on, learning that you could get away with murder if you and your people just kept your mouth shut. Willie decided that he would give pet ownership another go, this time choosing a horse that his family wouldn't butcher and eat for breakfast. The Pictons were boarding horses for others at this point, so he thought, why not? Willie got a colt named Goldie, and he treated her like a queen. For four years, he had a true friend, albeit equestrian. Their friendship would be cut short, though, after an accident when Goldie broke her leg. After taking her out to pasture and putting her down, Willie puts his character, his true character, on full display with his choice of how to memorialize his old friend. Instead of burying her and giving her a headstone, he lopped off her head and had it stuffed. He hung it above his bed in the Picton home's basement as a macabre tribute to a loyal steed. Cash had been flowing into the farm through multiple channels for years at this point, and their work ethic was paying off. The Pictons weren't just filthy, they were now filthy rich. But nothing good lasts on the Pictons' farm, and the family was hit with a terrible streak of bad luck. Personally, I think it was Goldie's curse after stuffing her and hanging her in that basement. On New Year's Day, 1978, Willie's father, 91-year-old Leonard Picton passed away, and the farm took a big hit to morale. Just a few months later, they would take a financial hit when one of their piggeries housing 600 hogs burnt to its foundation. Just a year after that, on April 1st, 1978, the bearded matriarch of the white trash millionaire Pictons died of cancer, 
she died with Willie by her side, marking a generational change in management and ownership of the now very valuable Picton Farm. After Louise passed, the farm was split evenly amongst all three children. The land that the Pictons had purchased back in 1963 for $18,000 was now worth at least 20 times that. The three children also received money from their parents' estate, just shy of $100K each, but there was a wrinkle written in for Willie's cut. Unlike his siblings who got their money up front, Willie was required to stay and run the family farm until he was 40, at least, if he wanted his cash. For agreeing to stay that 10 more years or so, he got an additional, albeit much smaller, sum up front. This was probably the parents' way of ensuring that Willie would have work, as well as ensuring the longevity and the legacy of the family farm. And Willie would certainly give the farm a legacy. Almost immediately, Willie started to make the farm his own, buying junk and salvaged vehicles at auction before hauling them back to the property. Before long, he had his own junkyard, selling parts and scraps at a markup. Little brother David chose construction as a career, but he chose to stay on the family farm as well to help with day-to-day -day operations. He and Willie each had half the brain needed to run things, and they put them together well. For instance, Dave found a way to make a little side money off the scrapyard. He rented it out to his local Hells Angels buddies to use as a chop shop. And before long, the yard was somewhat of a hangout spot for the undesirables. Willie even started his own meat business, making use of the slaughterhouse on the back of the property. Willie's methods became his own once he was on the farm, and Willie's methods are worth examining. In typical Picton style, he found a way to cut overhead on the livestock. He would go to the auctions and troll vendors looking to buy the sickly, emaciated livestock at a discount. He also had a unique process for butchering the animals. First, he would kill the animal by slitting its throat or shooting it between the eyes with a nail gun. Then, he would hang it by its ankle to let the blood drain. Using a handsaw, he would skin, gut, and dismember the animal before finally taking any choice cuts of meat. Butchering livestock has a lot of leftover parts, bones, organs, skin, hair, and when you're butchering 20 animals a day, like Willie was back then, it adds up pretty quick. Sometimes Willie would dig deep pits on his property and bury the waste material there, but more often than not, he would take barrels of biomaterial to West Coast Rendering where the oils and fats go on to be used in countless products. And anything left, he would just toss out to the pigs and they would eat it. They would eat just about anything. Willie would hone and perfect these strange methods for the next few years before unleashing them on a new kind of livestock. The sex workers prowling the night streets of Port Coquitlam and surrounding Vancouver. Willie's first run-in with prostitutes in the late 70s was inevitable, maybe even ironic, as his first contact with Vancouver's sex workers came during a trip to the rendering plant, the same rendering plant that he would eventually use to dispose of their bodies. Willie's interactions with this segment of the populace reveal a strange duality. On one hand, he saw a group of people who were down on their luck and needed help. Now that money came easy for him, he could help. Throughout his adulthood, in fact, Willie almost always had friends staying on the farm when they fell on hard times, and these people were almost always the burnouts of society. Drug addicts, violent criminals, but they needed Willie. And Willie was mostly kind in return, because he liked being seen as the good guy. He liked the trust that came with it. On the other hand, Willie was a sober man. In fact, he despised junkies, sex workers too. He would prey on the less fortunate's baser needs, both of his victims and those who he would rely on to keep his secrets for the next 20 years. It's not known exactly when Willie started killing, but the mid-80s is a good guess. That's when Willie started regularly using prostitutes and bringing them back to the farm. It goes directly against sex worker standard procedure to follow a strange man to a pig farm, but Willie was offering free drugs and top dollar for bottom shelf ass. It is believed that Willie's first victim was a drug addicted First Nations mother of two, 
23-year-old Rebecca Guno. She was last seen working Vancouver's downtown east side on June 22, 1983. This is where her and Willie's paths would cross. He probably offered her the vice for choice and a wad of cash to go back with him to the farm. After he used her for her services, he accused her of stealing money. This was a simple scheme that Willie used time and time again as an excuse to escalate things to violence. He would stab or strangle them to death before dragging their lifeless corpse out to the slaughterhouse to begin his ritual butchering. Yvonne Marlene Abagosis, a 26-year-old First Nation woman, would be the next to vanish from the same area on January 1st, 1984. With a couple kills under his belt now and no heat from law enforcement, Willie was gaining confidence. His ego was further boosted by the success of the farm, which was now making more money than ever, and the ragtag crew was becoming a family of misfits. Willie was still the oddball and the outcast of the group, but no one suspected him of being dangerous. But Willie was rapidly becoming more dangerous. More and more prostitutes were going missing from the east side. Sherry Rail disappeared in 84, and then Elaine Allenbach in April of 86, Teresa Williams in July of 88. In late 1989, Ingrid Sowett was picked up and never seen again. 25-year-old Nancy Ann Clark disappeared in August of 1991, and then in June of 1992, Kathleen Watley vanished. Many of these women, simply because of their life choices, were not being reported missing until months, sometimes years, after they had already been murdered. Willie was also very efficient in butchering and disposing of the women he was taking, something that was second nature now, due to years of slaughtering swine. This meant that once these women were reported missing, they would stay missing for years. And to make matters worse, it seemed as though the Vancouver police just didn't actively pursue cases with this kind of victim. No one had any idea that these women were being dismembered, fed to pigs, taken to the rendering plant, or mixed in and sold with picked in pork. Willie soon became known for giving folks around the farm free meat to win their favor. Meat that always seemed questionable, but it's the thought that counts, right? And even though his gifts of rotten mystery meat were usually trashed, it now seemed like Willie was always surrounded by friends. But that's not always a good thing if your new hobby is homicide. Fortunately for Willie, there was Dave. Just like when they were kids, Dave would always have his big brother's back. Over the past decade or so, Dave had been cultivating a reputation akin to that of a white trash crime boss. He had more than enough money from the farm and his day job working construction, but the Pictons never stopped hustling. He made several shady connections, dealing with the Hells Angels over the years, and he was known to put them to use when in a pinch. Whenever someone would ask about the piles of women's clothing accruing in Willie's room, Dave made them unsee it. Whenever Willie got too physical with a hooker and she pressed charges, Dave made sure she didn't appear in court. But as much love as Dave had for Willie, brothers still fight. And in the early 90s, Willie and Dave got into it as brothers do, and Willie moved out of the family home. He didn't move off the property. Hell, he'd only ever left town one time in his life. Instead, he parked a trailer at the back of the property, near the slaughterhouse, and called it home. You might think this is the time when things would escalate and his antics would really get out of control, but instead his path would cross with that of a young lady named Tanya Carr. She was the daughter of a family friend who needed a place to stay, and Willie obliged. Over the year or so that they lived together, Willie was kind, and he helped her get back on her feet. During that time, she brought out a side of Willie that would keep him from killing from 1992 to 1994. And it was in 1994 that the Pictons really hit pay dirt. Their farm was now estimated to be worth $7.2 million. And in the fall of that year, the Pictons sold a section of the farm to a townhouse development company for $1.7 million. Later that same year, the city of Port Coquitlam itself was the next to purchase a piece of Picton land for $1.2 million that they would develop a park on. Finally, in 1995, the school district of Port Coquitlam spent $2.3 million on a piece of Picton land to erect Blake Burn Elementary School. And just like that, the Pictons had more money than they could ever imagine. 
and it was this sudden surge of cash that would bring Willie back to a life of killing. Without the prying eyes of Tanya Carr, Willie started using his deep pockets to bait and kill prostitutes at a staggering rate. In 1995, Willie picked up and murdered four women, Catherine Gonzalez in March, Catherine Knight in April, Dorothy Spence in August, and Diana Melnick in December. Melnick's DNA would eventually be found on the Picton farm, making her the earliest victim with remaining DNA. It was also a big year for the farm. Willie and Dave opened up the Piggy Palace Good Times Society, a party hall on the edge of the property. It was registered as a nonprofit organization with the intent to organize, coordinate, manage, and operate special events, functions, dances, shows, and exhibitions on behalf of service organizations, sports organizations, and other worthy groups. And though it's true the Piggy Palace held some of those events, its true intention was to hold huge biker raves, parties, and live concerts every Saturday night. And these were big events, sometimes having as many as 2,000 people partying all over the property. According to reports of those who went, there was always a high number of what they believed to be prostitutes in attendance, which is interesting because local officials and police officers were also said to frequent the palace. And if things weren't ramping up enough already, it was also in 95 that police in Vancouver first came upon Willie's handiwork. Someone had tipped off the cops to a human skull just off in the brush on a stretch of old country road. The skull had been cut in half, hot dog style, not hamburger. Coroners concluded that the cuts made to the skull were made by someone very familiar with anatomy and handy with a bone saw. But it was also noted that they did not believe the cuts to be made by a medical professional because of the cattywampus uneven cut. The Jane Doe was never ID. Any skilled or even competent detective could use this information to begin putting together a profile. But this was the local police and the city officials of Vancouver, and they'd been turning a blind eye to the missing sex worker problem for years now. Willie was in the double digits by this point, and he wasn't even the only one fishing this pond. The Piggy Palace was an absolute hit. It was making a killing, so much so that Dave opted to move out next to the venue to better run it. He had gone from hosting cockfights from time to time to managing a music venue, so he figured why not. Willie was probably glad to have the space. Dave knew what Willie was doing, there's no way he didn't. And moving probably felt like a way to still be loyal to his brother while still putting a little space between them. They had both been fielding a lot more questions about the piles of women's clothing accruing in Willie's trailer. This was always a problem for Willie. Since pigs didn't have clothes, Willie never learned what to do with the clothes that came with the ladies, and he was too stupid to do anything about it. He threw the clothes of three more women into those piles in 1996, before ramping up to his most active years. In 97 alone, Willie killed 10 women. The unsuspecting swine must have been content with all their extra meals, but I'm sure all those trips to the rendering plant could exhaust a man enough to throw him off his game. It was on the way back from one of those trips in 1997 that Willie made a huge mistake targeting a bad bitch named Sandra Ringwald. Willie picked her up and convinced her to go back to the farm by paying as much as he needed to. Sandra bit because she was desperate, but the strange situation had her on high alert. They made the exchange as intended, and then Sandra asked to use his phone. While attempting to make a business call, she felt cold steel on her wrist and noticed Willie had cuffed her, and Sandra fought hard. She grabbed a butcher knife that she had taken note of earlier and started stabbing at Willie's face. She struck his jugular and sliced off part of his jawbone along with a few teeth. Seeing her chance, she bolted for the door and out towards the road, but Willie was hot on her trail. He tackled her to the ground and wrestled the knife away from her before plunging it into her stomach over and over. Sandra, now slick with her own gushing blood, broke free for a second time. She was moving much slower this time, struggling to hold in the internal organs that were attempting to slip away from her with every stride. 
Willie was too weak to chase her, suffering from severe blood loss, and he crawled back to his trailer. Sandra managed to flag down a good Samaritan who picked her up. They sped towards the hospital, but before getting too far away, she said, If I die, that's where the guy who did this to me lives, pointing back at the Picton farm. The cops were called by the hospital staff and told what was going on. They sped out to the property and found Willie face down in a pool of mud, blood, and pig shit. When he came to in the hospital, Willie pled self-defense, claiming that she'd tried to rob him. But even the Vancouver police weren't stupid enough to believe that and they charged him with attempted murder. But don't get your hopes up, because this ain't your happy ending. Just like every time before and after, Dave did everything he could to help his brother. He hired a PI that followed Sandra around and the Hells Angels to intimidate her. Sandra Ringwald did not appear on the day of court, and Willie walked. And even though Sandra Ringwald didn't put him away that day, her story was being talked about by all the women working the east side. Willie was now a known bad date, and the cops were aware of his violent tendencies. These would be some pretty severe issues for most men with a crippling drive to rape and murder prostitutes. But Willie wasn't most men anymore. He had money. Despite having pigs that were smarter than him, even Willie could use his money to sidestep problems and keep right on killing. Willie couldn't just go pick up women like he could before. So Willie needed somebody to do it for him. Fortunately, there were always a few burnouts or vagrants, graciously taking temporary residency on the Picton farm, which made finding a candidate pretty simple. These thin relationships born of dependency and desperation served Willie really well in the short term. But if you've seen my Dean Coral video, you may recognize this dynamic. Coral took advantage of his resources and his relationships to turn Owen Brooks and Wayne Henley into accomplices to bring him victims. And just like in that story, it would be these broken relationships that would eventually be Willie's undoing as well. Enter Gina Houston, a hooker grifter who had spent a lot of time on the Picton farm. She was also a giant piece of shit, so her and Willie got along like gangbusters. Willie offered her a proposition. He would pay rent for her to get her own place, along with some running around cash. And all she had to do was bring some hookers by from time to time. Gina happily obliged. She would troll local women's shelters, offering the vulnerable women inside the world on a crack pipe, and all they had to do was go back with her to the farm. If they had any objections, she would vouch for Willie, saying he was her fiancé and he wouldn't do anything, before offering them more money than they could turn down. 1998 brought another run-in with police despite their willful ignorance of the missing sex workers in their own city. The Vancouver Sun wrote a piece about one of Willie's victims, missing person Sarah DeVries. It also talked about the shocking amount of women missing from the area. An ex-employee of Dave Picton's, a man named Bill Hiscox, heard about the piece in the Sun and called in a tip. During the time he worked on the farm, he saw several piles of women's clothes, bags, and even IDs in Willie's place. The cops put surveillance on the farm, but when one of the countless missing women from the area was tied to another, much smaller serial killer, the police assumed that their job was done. They cleared Willie's name and pulled the patrol from the farm. During that time, Willie went on unfazed by the article, maybe due to illiteracy, but he moved another nine women through his slaughterhouse in 1998, right under the noses of the police. In the few years since its opening, the Piggy Palace had become an oasis of depravity, and it was starting to take a toll on the local community. Complaints about noise and zoning were persistent, and the palace wasn't exactly up to code. It had been filed as a non-profit, but the Pictons never kept any books or financial records of any kind and it was also becoming a haven for the criminal misfits of the town. It was something they had had a problem with since the closing of Riverview Hospital in 83, the same establishment that once pumped educated and wealthy professionals into the community had now become a fissure of the mentally and financially unstable. 
the Pictons had received several warnings about the ordinance and zoning violations during the year of 98, but they had done nothing about them. So when the Piggy Palace had its New Year's Eve bash at the end of the year, ignoring all official orders, the Vancouver police decided to shut the establishment down. In the early morning hours of January 1st, 1999, the farm was raided and the party was shut down. The palace was slammed with an injunction, banning any future gatherings. It's true the Vancouver police didn't put much effort into all those missing women for the last 15 years, but you can't be too hard on them, because they were clearly busy with noise complaints. The police had stopped looking for a serial killer, but the women of the east side had continued going missing. It was public outcry that prompted TV's America's Most Wanted to run an episode about the missing Vancouver women. It aired in July of 1999, and in it, they offered $100,000 to anybody with information, leading to the one responsible. And this probably would have worked, if not for one person. I'll let you guess. You got it. David Picton. Plenty of people knew what Willie was doing, but anybody they suspected would talk paid a stiff price. One of the people Willie became friends with while they were living and working on the farm was a man named Andy Bellwood. Back in February of 1999, the pair were hanging out in Willie's trailer when Willie out of nowhere suggested that they get some hookers. And before Andy could even say anything, Willie had started describing his entire killing process. How he gutted and bled them, he told him about the pigs and the rendering plant, the whole thing. He wasn't drunk, he didn't drink, and he wasn't overtaken with guilt. At this point he was killing nearly a woman a month, and I think he was just too in the moment to realize that he had fucked up. But when he did realize, days later, he got Dave involved. Andy was called into Dave's office and accused of theft before being savagely beaten. A subtle reminder that he didn't know anything. In March of that year, Dave delivered another beating to somebody who was too curious. Len Ellingson, yet another crackhead who lived on the farm, had heard rumors about human limbs in freezers. When she decided that she had questions, Dave answered with a question of his own. Why did you steal those tools? And then he beat the hell out of her for doing it. Lynn Ellington stayed on the farm regardless. She didn't have anywhere else to go. She asked Willie for a ride to go pick up some crack one day, and he was happy to help. On the way back though, Willie had a stop of his own. They convinced a prostitute to go back with them and get high. Lynn and the hooker smoked crack together while Willie kept himself busy. But once they were done, Lynn went to her room, leaving Willie and the woman alone. Hours later, Lynn was awoken by a noise coming from the slaughterhouse. Since it was the middle of the night, she got out of bed and went to go investigate. As she rounded the open door of the slaughterhouse, her expression changed from curiosity to horror. The same look of horror, I'm sure, that young Willie expressed upon seeing his beloved calf butchered for meat. Because hanging on the exact same type of hook was the woman Lynn was getting high with just hours earlier. She let out a scream that broke Willie from his work. Instead of killing her, Willie warned her not to say a word, and he gave her money so she could go get trashed and forget about it. And that's exactly what she did. He continued to fund her addictions for the next year in exchange for her silence. And Willie's choice here is a confusing one. He chose to let her live, despite what she had seen. Not just that, but in 1999, she had OD'd on the farm twice, and the only reason that she lived was that Willie called the cops and the ambulance out to the property. Even though he'd only killed six women in the year of 1999, he was getting more careless with his process. DNA and physical evidence were slung everywhere. So if he would risk having cops come to the farm, it would seem he thought of her as a friend, and he cared about her well-being. That is, until you find out that he offered to pay a man named Scott Chubb to kill her. But Scott Chubb refused. Things were slowing down for Willie at this point, and he must have felt the effects of losing the Piggy Palace and Gina Houston's growing ineffectiveness as an accomplice. So in 2000, Willie found somebody much better suited to bring him women than Gina ever was. A truly diabolical and sadistic woman named Dinah Taylor, who shared Willie's hatred for sex workers and addicts alike. 
she took a similar approach to Gina, combing women's shelters for the most desperate and downtrodden. But Dinah avoided any sex talk at all, inviting them back to her Uncle Willie's house for a party instead. She would tell them that Uncle Willie's got piles of money and drugs and fun. Based on the DNA evidence uncovered later, Dinah was also much more involved with the killing process than Gina ever was. Despite a slow transition period, leading to Willie only taking three women in 2000, he and Dinah were ready to hit the east side hard in 2001. For 20 years now, women had been steadily going missing from Vancouver's downtown east side. The complaints were piling up to the point they were unavoidable. The RCMP finally went over Vancouver police's head and made a federal case on the matter called Project Even Handed. And it was a good thing there were some fresh eyes on the case because Willie and Dinah were hitting their stride. They hung another eight missing women cases on Project Even Handed in 2001. 2002 would have likely been worse if not for one spectacular chub, Scott Chubb. The man Willie had propositioned to kill Lynn Ellingson after she stumbled upon his incriminating slaughter session was the man who would eventually bring him down. C. Chubb had recently lost his job, and he had been fighting a lot with his old lady. One of those fights got so loud that the police were called and a cop came out, and that cop who took the call just happened to be in the market for a confidential informant, and he left Scott his phone number. And when Scott and his old lady finally called it quits, he had to find a place and pay rent. So Chubb called the detective to call in some snitch chips. He didn't sell Willie out immediately, but when the info he had on local dealers wasn't going to cover his rent, he began to recall to the officer all the unregistered weapons that he had seen on the farm. Now that the RCMP was breathing down their neck, the Vancouver police had a newfound interest in the missing women cases in their area. Rumors about Willie and the farm had come up too often in this case not to take this chance. So on February 6, 2002, prompted by an illegal arms tip, the Picton's farm was finally raided. Police on scene immediately located one of the illegal guns in Willie's laundry room and placed him under arrest before continuing the search. In Willie's nightstand, they found a flare gun that had been modified to shoot 12-gauge shells. This was sitting next to a pair of fluffy handcuffs. Next, they found a piece of paper with the name Heather Bottomley written on it, a woman that had gone missing the previous year. Shortly after, they found an inhaler with Serena Abbotsway's name on the side, another missing woman, and they knew this was far more than unregistered guns. They left and got a property-wide search warrant before coming back with Project Evenhand and sealing off the largest crime scene in Canadian history. Willie bonded out as soon as he could, but it was not long before they found what they needed to put that sick fuck back in a box. A cushion and a shower hose covered in blood that were tested for DNA came back belonging to Mona Wilson, yet another missing woman. And with that, Willie was finally arrested for murder on February 22, 2002, as the search of the farm would continue for another 18 months. Willie was too stupid to understand the gravity of the situation that he was in which made him a tough person to interrogate. No matter what he was asked, the answer was always the same. No comment. He did offer to confess to everything if the police would pull down the fences, a reference to the barrier erected around the search site, but that was denied. Instead, the police played on Willie's arrogance and stupidity. They put an undercover cop in Willie's cell to get the information. The plant played up Willie's notoriety feeding Willie's ego and it worked like a charm. Before long, Willie was spilling his guts like he was back in the trailer with Andy Bellwood. The police combed the farm for evidence, but because of Willie's unique disposal methods, his attention to detail in his early days, and the sheer amount of time that had passed, finding DNA evidence of all the women that Willie had killed would be impossible. Despite these issues, remains from 33 women were recovered from the farm. Police also found buckets containing severed heads and limbs. The skulls were cut hot dog style, and the hands and the feet were set within. The slaughterhouse was full of piles of women's clothing along with rotting pig parts. The police even found a 22 caliber revolver with a dildo on the end of it. 
but once that search finally concluded, Willie was initially charged with and pleaded not guilty to 26 counts of first degree murder. Because the case spanned so much time and encompassed so many victims, the trial was split up. The prosecutors put their six strongest cases on the first trial, and on December 6, 2007, he was found guilty of six counts of second degree murder. It was most likely reduced to second degree because Willie was the only person facing charges, and there wasn't a soul who believed Willie was the only one complicit. Dave Picton, Dinah Taylor, and Gina Houston never faced charges. Dinah Taylor's DNA was on 113 pieces of evidence found on the farm. Willie received life in prison with the potential for parole in 25 years. If that sounds light though, for a rapist and a killer of 50 or so women, don't fret. The remaining 20 charges of murder were stayed by the court in August of 2010, but those charges will come down the line long before old Willie ever steps before a parole board. Even though it was discovered pretty quick during the search what Willie was doing with some of the human remains, the Canadian government waited two years to issue a public health warning about the possibility of human meat making its way into public circulation. Thank you, thank you everybody for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for your chance to win some picked in pork. Follow all those socials if that's what you do. And I will see you on the next one.